everyone. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with a great mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor John Cruikshank. We are here for the mayor's monthly update and here is at the Trump National Golf Club. It doesn't get any better than this. We're looking at the ocean right now, golfers and and it's another great day in RPV. How are you doing? Well, I'm good. And of course, as the sun is starting to poke its head out of the clouds, it's always great to be here at Trump National. Of course, you just met with your committee and commission chairs, the volunteers every month. You have your mayor's breakfast. So much to talk about with everyone in our community right now, as our city has the ongoing state of emergency still with the Portuguese Bend landslide complex area. And hopefully the rainy season is slowing down because the rains have really affected the landslide. You're gonna give us an update just starting with the impacts we're seeing and how we're dealing with it as a city. Well, you're absolutely right about our, uh, the people that run our commissions and our planning, com our planning commission and our committees. They are busy mm -hmm. and there are a lot of issues, but of course, as you mentioned, the landslide issue is the number one priority. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I've read that sometimes they've, they've found that water that comes out of the landslide area is 40 years old, like it was actually entered the uh, peninsula 40 years ago. So, um, of course, the heavier than normal rainfall that we've had over the last two years is uh, having an effect and it doesn't necessarily happen the next day. It takes potentially weeks, months mm -hmm. and years for us to see the full impact of what's happened. So well, an immediate impact, though, as you mentioned, is our trails. We have eight miles of our trails that are currently closed. It's certainly a safety issue. Um, also, as a safety issue, a lot of these roads are used for emergency access, and those have actually been closed as well, which creates more of a threat for all of our residents on mm -hmm. this side of the hill. Um, we do have our recreation and park staff. They continually work with the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy to try to get these trails safe and reopened, and they are working to do that. Um, but it does take a lot of time because some of these fissures and, and open areas are 10, 20, 30 feet deep and many feet wide, and so they're a huge safety issue, and it's something we can't just let people go uh, out there on those trails. Record rains and, like you say, unprecedented land movement where, you know, the landslide complex, which we're all familiar with, living the hill that's been around for many, many years, you know, it used to be, it would creep at inches, right? Now we're seeing movement of feet at a time, many feet. And so with all that happening, you know, you mentioned the trails, obviously neighborhoods in the complex area with some homes being red tagged. Um, and then you've got Palos Verdes Drive South, the road is being impacted. Um, but you're working on it as a council, you know, fast and furiously, as fast as you can go in government yes, yes. Um, to get the funding, to get it happening and to in do these mitigation measures, which is what I want to talk about next. The city is moving forward with emergency work by installing some hydroggers coming up to get the water out to help with slowing the movement. Yes. Why don't you update us on what's going on with that because the community is waiting patiently because they want to see something being done, right? Well, absolutely. And, and um, you know, without getting too crazy technical, the landslide has a lot of land mass. That land mass is, mass is moving on the uh, bentonite slip plane. And uh, what causes that is a few things. As the friction becomes less, and in other words, it has more of an ability to slide, and it has more weight because of the water, that's the reason you want to have hydro augers. Hydro augers are very different from what we can know about water wells, which are typically drilled vertically right into the earth. Hydro augers are actually horizontally drilled, and they're not just a direct horizontal, but you, you can direct them in different directions. And the ones we're talking about, there's not just one drill hole, but there's five. Okay. And so those five kind of, they finger out into the, into the earth. And uh, what they're basically doing is drawing water out, trying to use gravity, uh, and by drilling the hole, putting in perforated pipe, and that perforated pipe starts to pull water out. And so that's the whole idea is to, to reduce the water table, to pull the water out, to take that weight off the landmass. And we have two of those planned right now. Right, and when you talk about the landmass and the landslide complex area, there's three landslides we refer to, Portuguese Bend, Abalone Cove, Klondike Canyon. What we want to do is the landslide itself the, has increased in size. And it includes all three of the landslide complexes mm -hmm. that you just said. So the the two emergency hydroggers, we'll call them, because ultimately there's going to be more than two. Correct. The two emergency ones are ones that are going to help alleviate the pressures on all three of those. Right. And so um, they are being pulled from that project we had that was has been developed years ago mm -hmm. so that we can get something done now so that we can start alleviating that pressure. So it'll help actually help all three of the landslide complexes, okay. and that's the goal is to alleviate that for all the residents out there. 
And, um, and to do something now, one thing that's been going on with this council back in October declared the state of emergency. Um, and now we've got the president involved and a federal declaration. Talk about the impact that's going to have that from, you know, it, this is not just RPV's issue. It's really the whole community at large and, and everybody's issue. So um, what's going on with the federal declaration, how that's going to help us with funding and getting things done to resolve this? Right. Well, you remember back in February, we were uh, on the news a lot. We were talking about uh, requesting for the governor of California to declare our landslide complex an emergency and what the governor came back and said it's already covered with the emergency he declared for the counties Los Angeles County being mm -hmm. the one we're in what we uh, were told by the governor is that uh, in order to get some uh, immediate relief uh, he's going to request and as long as the dollar amount within LA County is enough he would be able to go to the president of the United States and ask for a, a declaration of a federal emergency and uh, the President Biden has done that which actually is really good news um, for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and for the two uh, landslide abatement districts because what that allows is to uh, for anything to for mitigation uh, for what's happened and to fix what's occurred we'll be able to apply for funding um, only public agencies, which are the two uh, landslide abatement districts and the city, are considered public entities. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it does not include private residents, but uh, what we're trying to also do is still continue to go through Los Angeles County uh, Office of Emergency Services, and uh, we believe that there's going to be an opportunity to get some relief for our private, private uh, residents as well. Excellent. A lot of those residents were at a recent town hall meeting the city just had. Um, it was really important. You brought a lot of stakeholders together as well as the experts, geologists for the city, um, staff, our public works director, and the community to like talk about what is going on. Tell us about that town hall meeting, what was accomplished, and your message right now to residents that are worried about, you know, the, about what's happening to their homes. They're worried about driving Palos Verdes Drive South, all those things. Right. And, and the list of those things could go on forever. And, and because it is, it's a complex landslide, it's a complex problem. And you have people that live in the landslide area and you have tens of thousands of our residents that don't live in the landslide area. And everyone has different knowledge of what the landslide actually means to them. Um, and everyone obviously is in different levels of stress with that. And we understand that. Um, we had three hours at the new Ladera Linda Community Center to um, not only explain who's working together and how it all works, but to discuss the landslide, how we kind of got to this point, and now, most importantly, what's going to be done and what's planned to be done. And so that that's what we accomplished. Um, our goal, there was a number, unfortunately we didn't get to the question and answer as much as we wanted to because we had a few technical difficulties. Um, but all those questions that were asked by the community are going to be responded to by the city manager and the team of experts, including our public works director, Ramsey Awad, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that all those questions are addressed. Um, and probably by the time this airs, there'll potentially be that landslide town hall uh, put up on RPV TV for people to watch. Um, one thing, though, we want to, that really seems to be impacting thousands of people on a daily basis is Palos Verdes Drive South. I think there's 15,000 cars a day. That's right. That cross here we are off you know off PB Drive South now um, about a few weeks ago whatever it felt like they really the, that ski jump as they call it was looking good and then it split open again so what's happening there how are we addressing this because it just keep throwing money at it and the world keeps splitting and what are we what's happening next well I mean anyone that's lived in Rancho Palos Verdes for any amount of time which is most most of our residents know that every year there's been issues and every year the city spends roughly a million dollars a year repairing that. So it's not a new issue, it's just the last couple of years has just been a lot worse. And like you mentioned, they just fix it and then a couple of days later it's, it's pretty bad again. So um, at this point now we're just kind of chasing our tails. Right. And so there's some uh, other engineering ideas uh, potentially that we can utilize more of a temporary surface that could be moved along You're with the foam movement. Foam blocks. Foam blocks. And so, in order to uh, do that, and they, they would have the strength of you know, any type of road, so there wouldn't be that issue. And they could be moved uh, so that, and reformed a lot quicker so that we could keep the road open quicker and not have this ongoing repaving. 
that continually just gets destroyed over and over again. So there's going to be a time very soon where there's maybe some road closures, uh, maybe some rerouting of Palos Verdes Drive south in the landslide area. But ultimately, we want to have it so that it, even with all this movement, and like we talked earlier, it stopped raining, but the movement's going to continue for a while right. because that ground is saturated. Yeah. And one of the, one of the um, unfortunate situations um, that we've seen is with Wayfarers Chapel, the impact on the historic landmark in our city. Um, and just recently, the city did end up having to red tag the Wayfarers Chapels, what used to be the visitor center, their administrative offices, but the chapel hasn't been yellow or red tagged. But as a community, we're all, we all feel for them. And um, the, now they're temporarily, the congregation, there's, the Wayfarers are meeting in um, Palos Verdes Estates at St. Francis. But there's been talk that the, maybe this historical landmark is gonna have to get dismantled. I think it's not official yet, but I think we'll just, what's your thoughts as mayor when we see what's going on there? And, and the hope that this chapel somehow can still be saved. Well, I mean, the very first thing is, is that Wayfarers Chapel needs to reopen in, in some form that uh, they feel is safe and, and uh, because it's a huge part of who we are. And so um, I know our city is always uh, there to help whatever that means, whether it's, um, you know, helping them with permits to move mm -hmm. or whatever that is. But I know that um, our neighbors, Palos Verdes Estates and the church there are, are, have stepped up to help with their congregation. Mm -hmm. I know that a number of uh, private uh, resources through our city want to help. Um, so we're there to help them. We want to see them open, reopen as quickly right. as possible. You know, our council is fully focused on, on helping mitigate the landslide movement. We understand that um, even though it's 400 homes and there's 12,000 residential home structures in our city, um, we understand they're a vital part of our community and we're gonna do everything we can to help them. Moving on to another massive topic, it's the city's housing element update, a document that's required by our state that shows how we're gonna be dealing with housing um, needs in our community across all income levels. This has gone on for years. You're working on what's called the sixth cycle of the whole process. And why don't you explain to the community, um, you had a, I've never seen so many residents come to a council meeting as I did at your last meeting um, in April. And uh, people are concerned about how we're addressing housing and, our, and getting that plan to the state and approved. And that's what you did. So kind of give us the whole background and what's going on there. Well, yes, that meeting, we literally, the entire council chamber was full and the two overflow rooms mm -hmm. were full and people were parked up on Hawthorne Boulevard, which is something I had never, ever heard of. So um, yes, it's important and people should be concerned about it. Um, it's not something that just happened overnight. Like you mentioned, these are eight year cycles. We're in the six one of the eight year cycle. The only difference is this current six cycle is asking us to do 647 housing units um, and these are like you said all income levels but the 647 are primarily moderate to low income yes. and so um, these aren't just market rate and so for it to for a developer to pencil out a project they're not just putting in low or moderate income they're putting in market rates so we're talking many many more than 647 units so it's a very important thing and of course the state has they you know they always say use the carrot and the stick the state is not all anything about carrots right now. It's all stick, and the stick is this builder's remedy. And so there's uh, projects that are proposed uh, that are just well beyond what we've ever seen in our city. Mm -hmm. And so um, you have a lot of people that understand the importance of passing this housing element and rezoning so that the, the housing authority up in California, state of California, deems our housing element in substantial compliance. Once they deem that and we get a letter saying that, then there can be no more builder's remedies that we're talking about. Um, so uh, there are some builder's remedies that are currently in the system and those do need to be processed. And in terms of their applications and all those still have a lot of discussions in front of them. Right, right. Um, and, but all we did, we weren't approving any projects the other night. We were actually changing our zoning in certain locations and we were approving our housing element and that's it. And so we actually also passed an urgency ordinance so that we could get that post haste up to the state of California and not wait the typical 60 days or so that we would have to. Right, and so again, so that our community understands what you are approving 
is to show again that we can provide for these this types of housing and have the zoning to accommodate it but it doesn't mean that necessarily you have to build these projects currently that that is actually correct we're, we're not, not the only city on the hill without their housing element approved either for example right like Palos Verdes estates so yes yeah, so rolling hills and rolling hills estates both have approved housing elements and and unfortunately for Palos Verdes estates they're also working on theirs and they're going to try to wrap theirs up this year so just to clarify with the community the next steps and what happens next and also a little bit more detail about how those districts work out for rezoning yes um, well, first of all, um, the next thing is that the, our past housing element and also the rezoning, that all went up to the state. Um, they've already reviewed our housing element and said that, you know, they have no more comments, technical comments. Okay. And so the hope is, is that, and, and they have 60 days to review that. Um, we hope they don't take the whole 60 days, but we, we believe now because we passed our urgency ordinance, we believe that we're in substantial compliance. And so um, we want, we're cutting off the builder's remedy. Um, we still have to go through the formal processes, but uh, that's where we are right now. There's a lot on your plate between the landslide and this. Um, I was also at the, um, the last, it's really, I think watching the council meeting, you learned a lot about what's going on. There's 31 sites that have been approved for like rezoning, right? So I talk about how that all comes into play and, and what the impact that will have. Right, there's 31 uh, sites that are included in the housing element. Um, anyone that's been following it knows that we kind of started with a real high majority of those sites being on Western Avenue, which is the our eastern part of our city. Right. Uh, the council felt that that was not the right way to do it. It's best if we're gonna have, let's call it pain, if we're gonna have some pain, that it should be spread across the entire city, not right. just one area, because that's just not fair. And what was good about doing that, not only for fairness reason, but also the state came back and said, you can't just put it in one area anyhow. So we probably wouldn't have gotten it passed if it was all in Western. So that was the first thing. So these 31 sites are all throughout the city. Um, 26 of the parcels, they fall under what we call a mixed use overlay district, which is basically residential overlay in a commercially zoned area. And then kind of on the flip side, there's three of those parcels that are residential overlay districts. And those are residential overlays in the institutionally zoned areas. Anything else you want to comment? So I know because there's a lot of misinformation too about what's happening with the housing situation. Is there anything you feel that you'd like residents to know? Um, yeah, there, there is. Um, I think the residents should understand that all five of the city council members, we live in the city right. and we understand how important local control is versus Sacramento dictating. All of these things that we're being asked to do are being done through Sacramento forcing us to do this. And we're doing everything we can in our, our power to be able to maintain what Rancho Palos Verdes is all about. And, and that is, you know, this open space. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't want high density here. That, that's right. not what we're about. That's not why we were created in 1973. And so I tell people that if you want to see a real change in that, you start looking on the ballot and you yes. start realizing who you're voting for at all levels of government. Yep, you're right, you have to stay active. We're gonna, you've been very active as a council. I think this week alone you had, you know, city council meeting, you had the town hall, Trifecta. you had a budget workshop, here we are, your mayor's breakfast and now our city talk show. Um, tell us about the budget workshop. Oddly enough, I'm gonna say that was the funnest part of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, money. yeah, right. No, we, well, and it, it would be bad if the money wasn't good, but fortunately we have um, an amazing finance advisory committee. We have a, a fantastic uh, staff, a finance de department staff that uh, really understand the priorities and how to make sure that our revenues, in other words, the amount we bring in is always more than what we're spending. Right. I mean, it, that, that, a third grader can understand that if you explain it to them. Yes. Um, and, and our city does a great job of that. And not only that, uh, they, they add to that the reserve. So you start looking at the actual figures. Um, the anticipated revenues are going to be roughly $38.8 million. And the operating expenditures are supposed to be around 37.6. So you can see there's a slight difference. Mm -hmm. um, our revenues have increased modestly and um, our expenditures actually have reduced a little bit which is they're both going in the trending in the right direction um, going back to the landslide issue though these are huge capital improvement 
projects that have huge expenses to them. And so upcoming, and we'll, I know we'll talk about that. CIP workshop coming up. You have more, more uh, ways to talk about how you're going to spend money on April 29th, looking at yes. um, uh, public infrastructure and facilities and what's on the horizon for the city. Anything you want to note? I mean, the, it's the public meeting on April 29th. Well, it's a, there's a five-year capital improvement plan that we put together, although we look at the capital improvements every single year um, because, you know, priorities do change. Um, so uh, that right now our capital improvement fund has a balance that's a 35.3 million. Yes. So our infrastructure management advisory committee uh, does a wonderful job. Um, we have a public works staff that's second to none, uh, led by Ramsey Awad, and, um, and they they've had three meetings themselves mm -hmm. workshops to get to this point to get it to us so we know that they put in a lot of effort and work and we look forward to that uh, meeting on april 29th right. obviously the city's top priority like you're saying is the landslide but you're talking about roads sewers buildings parks all that stuff so there's going to be some trade-offs where you can spend the money well right and i you know we talk a lot about the landslide and it is top of mind but i want all of our residents to know that infrastructure is not something you could just set aside and then hope it self heals it's it, it doesn't. You, you have to continue to maintain it. And that keeps the cost down uh, in the long run because a well-maintained road or sewer system, not only is it working better, but when it's maintained, it doesn't start to fall apart quicker. And so the cost will be maintained at a, a better rate for years to come. So we understand that. We have maintenance programs for all of that. And um, so we haven't forgotten about any part of the city. Um, we want to make sure everything works so that no other people have any issues down the line. Right. One thing we know is going to work out, we, we expect, is whale of a day has, was rescheduled, uh, long awaited. It's going to be the 39th annual. It got postponed because of weather. April 27th is whale of a day. I was going to say, and, and people don't know this because we're filming here at Trump National, and I'm facing out toward Catalina, and I think during this first part of the interview with you, I'm pretty sure I saw a whale breaching while we were talking. In fact, I see a boat over there, a couple boats over there out the window right now. Yes. Um, so I'm pretty sure the kids and, and the families are going to see whales breaching. Bring your binoculars, and they're counting whales. They've got the board where they're counting each time the one's migrating. We, we always love that. I think the uh, whale was waving uh, the tail at you to say thumbs up. Is that what that there. was? That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, tails up. Tails uh, up. There's, yeah, go on whaleofaday.com. Like you're saying, it's a fantastic, um, beloved community event celebrating the migration of the whale. And um, I'm expecting that uh, we're going to at least be seeing a few that are, they just love to come by. It's the perfect spot to come up the coastline and... Uh, As mayor, I'm predicting a perfectly beautiful sunny day and everyone should come out, participate. And on the subject of participation, I must also forgot to mention, the RPV Leadership Academy is in full swing and yes. you are attending that. Really amazing opportunity for residents to uh, come and learn about what it takes to be a leader. Liz, did you ever go to that? I did, I did it with uh, my husband Don and I took together and of course he ended up on the Infrastructure Management Advisory Committee after that. It's amazing just to see how government works. Um, you were already a speaker at one of the meetings? I, I did. I was at opening night at Ladera Linda Community Center. Um, I understand they're going to be taking some field trips and yes. seeing different things within. They'll meet all the council members. Um, and, and more importantly, the council members really are our city staff and department heads um, talking about what they do because each department does something so unique, but then they also all work together to make our city the wonderful place it is. And so I think there's 25 people that attend. Um, unfortunately, it started, so if you want to do this, which I recommend to everyone. Yes. Stay tuned for 2025. Yeah, exactly. And I understand that the uh, founding mayor of our city and founder, Ken Dida, was there. So, Right, and, and what was awesome about it is uh, Ken talked about whole, the whole creation of our city and save our coastline and the work that, that he and many others had done to, to get us to the incorporation in 1973. And... Uh, Ken Dida is an inspiration to all of us. And I understand our today's cameraman, Jeff Coven, was there filming, and he told me he's going to be filming all these uh, meetings, so we think we'll maybe see them on our TV for that information. Well, I'm pretty sure our friend <laughs> Jeff, I'm pretty sure our friend Jeff knows a lot about our city. One yeah. day you should interview him yeah, and get his thoughts on it. Yeah, maybe he'll end up on a committee or commission. <laughs> he has to move to RPV, though, right? That's, and oh, also, he doesn't live in RPV? Not, no, but he, no, he used to, right? I don't know. If we're, okay. We're talking off camera. <laughs> the one thing I wanted to say is to, about information on the Leadership Academy, um, and all this again on the website and I know if you're interested in being on a committee or commission they're still top taking applications there's a cutoff yes. in May so uh, just check that out and um, there, there's actually involved. an opening in every one of our yeah. committees and our planning commission yes so lots of ways to get involved 
Um, I think we kind of jumped around. We, we're at the end of the show. Any final mayor's announcements that you want to promote right now um, as we wrap it up? Uh, a few things I want to talk about. Um, first of all, just so people know, I, I and the other three mayors on the peninsula, we do meet every month to have lunch and talk about common issues and, and things to share thoughts. Uh, we really do look at all four cities on the peninsula as, as one many times, um, and we share those ideas. I, I was just in Torrance um, providing a commemorative uh, certificate to outgoing council member Mike Griffiths. Um, and he, he's been a, a long-standing Torrance council member. Um, once again, Torrance is a great friend of Rancho Palos Verdes, but important also is that Mike's fighting for local control, and so uh, the Save Our Neighborhoods group, and, and uh, he, he's been instrumental in a lot of these things. It, so we really wanted to give him a thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a much sadder note, of course, we lost one of our, our lieutenant, uh, uh, our deputies, actually, uh, Dan, Daniel Okamoto. Um, tragically lost his life and and so that that was a real a blow to our community um, and we uh, of course he survived by his grandmother and parents and and his brother um, but we're keeping him and his family uh, in our thoughts and prayers and and that was really tragic um, you know not as tragic but there was a small plane crash that occurred uh, right off the coast here off the of Trump National fortunately that was a happier ending um, in, in terms of that um, I believe that uh, both the pilot and his dog were able to swim uh, to safety, which yes. was good. You're probably showing some yes, video footage. Yes, we have footage we're going to show now of, of the plane that was going into the water. And then I hiked down uh, the following day, and the plane is washed ashore and, and got some footage that we're sharing now. But what a, an amazing mm -hmm. outcome for that pilot and dog um, to have been okay and, um, you know, uh, just uh, amazing, really a miracle that yeah. you can survive that. I'd like to also mention, um, we did have a fire in Lamita, but it was one that was witnessed by many of our east side residents uh, mm -hmm. down at Vista Verde, which is, a, you know, Lamita is a, a very close neighbor, and that, that was a large structure fire, uh, multifamily residential, and it was, in, 16 units were lost there. And, yeah. and, and But I will give our Los Angeles County Fire uh, Department a lot of credit. Um, our interim chief, Brian Kane, came to our city council meeting and talked about the entire incident and the challenges that, that he had. Um, it was a fire started uh, in a microwave right. um, during dinner time. And um, so we want to stress the importance of not only calling 911, but knowing where you're calling from and the proper address because there was a little bit of a delay because mm -hmm. the, they needed to coordinate exactly where the, the fire was. Um, and so we want to make sure that all our residents know that if you're calling 911, uh, you know the address of where the location or just call straight to the sheriff's or fire department and just make sure you have enough details to get the response you need. Yes, yes. Um, and with that, we're going to wrap it up. Again, I want to send my condolences as well to um, Daniel Okamoto's yes. family and um, we'll close the show in his honor and to all, everyone that's serving our community. We can't say enough, including you. So yeah, with that, you. we'll be back in a month again with your update. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk from the Trump National Golf Club. Thanks again to the Trump team for um, hosting us here, and we hope you all have a safe and happy day. Thanks for tuning in.